1963, Pontiac built an engine so dangerous GM tried to kill it. So powerful NASCAR couldn't contain it. And so secret even its own engineers risked their jobs to keep it alive. This is the story of the 421 Super Duty, the engine that defied Detroit and nearly started a war. In the early 1960s, the American horsepower wars were at full throttle. Automakers were pushing the limits, battling to build the fastest, most powerful machines for both the streets and the racetrack. But Pontiac had a secret weapon, an engine so dominant that it reshaped the performance landscape almost overnight, the 421 Super Duty. This wasn't just another V8. It was an engineering marvel, built for speed, power, and victory. It crushed records, defied expectations, and cemented Pontiac's reputation as a performance powerhouse. But then, just as quickly as it rose to dominance, it was gone. Why did GM pull the plug on one of the most legendary racing engines of its time? Stay tuned, because today we're diving deep into the rise, fall, and lasting impact of the 421 Super Duty, the birth of a legend. By 1961, Pontiac found itself overshadowed in the super stock drag racing category. Competitors like Chevrolet, Ford, and Dodge were dominating with engines displacing over 400 cubic inches, while Pontiac's largest offering was the 389 cubic inch V8. Though capable, the 389 wasn't enough to compete with the likes of the Chevy 409 or the Dodge 413 Max Wedge. Pontiac needed something bigger, bolder, and faster. Enter the 421 Super Duty, an enlarged version of the 389 V8, introduced as a dealer-installed option for racing. As an enlarged version of the SD 389, the 421 SD quickly became a dominant force in both NASCAR and drag racing. Engineered for maximum durability and power, it featured a 4.09-inch bore and 4.0-inch stroke, along with a forged steel crankshaft and connecting rods for added strength. Lightweight forged aluminum pistons helped improve efficiency and performance, while dual four-barrel carburetors provided ample fuel delivery. The compression ratio was 11.0 to 1 in 1962. The 421 wasn't meant to replace the 389, but to complement it. Available with heavy-duty driveline components, the 421 could be fitted to any Catalina or Ventura two-door model, making it a versatile choice for racers and enthusiasts alike. The 421 Super Duty made its racetrack debut in 1961, when Hayden Prophet drove a 421-equipped Pontiac to victory at the Pomona Valley Timing Association's Top Stock Championship. This win was a harbinger of things to come, as the 421 quickly established itself as a force to be reckoned with on both the drag strip and the NASCAR circuit. What if Pontiac had beaten the Hemi? Would muscle cars still rule today? The Rise The Super Duty wasn't born in a boardroom. It was forged in rebellion. Pontiac's engineers, sick of losing to Chevy's 409, went rogue. They bored out the 389, stuffed it with forged aluminum pistons, and topped it with dual carburetors. The result? A 465-horsepower monster on paper. But GM's execs had no idea what they'd unleashed. Pontiac's success on the track was undeniable. By 1962, the Super Duty was unstoppable. Fireball Roberts' Daytona 500 win? A warning shot. But Ford wasn't sleeping. They sent spies to Pontiac's proving grounds, desperate to crack the 421's secrets. What they found? A ticking time bomb. Joe Weatherly secured the Grand National Series championship with nine wins and 39 top five finishes in 52 races. The Super Duty wasn't just a powerful engine, it was a winning engine. For 1963, Pontiac made further improvements to the 421, increasing the compression ratio from 11 to 1 to 12 to 1 and raising the red line to 6,400 RPM. The Catalina, which housed the 421, was also lightened through the use of aluminum components and a drilled frame. These enhancements made the 1963 Catalina with the Super Duty one of the fastest cars of its time, with 405 horsepower and 425 pound-feet of torque. 
This high-performance machine could launch from 0 to 60 miles per hour in approximately 5.2 seconds, depending on gearing, tires, and driver skill. Its quarter-mile performance was equally impressive, clocking in at around 13.7 seconds at 107 miles per hour. Mechanics Accounts and Insider Conflict, Malcolm McKellar, Pontiac Engineer. We'd test the SD at midnight. GM's spies patrolled the proving grounds, so we'd disguise the engines as truck parts. One night, a Chevy exec showed up. We revved it to 7,000 RPM and blew the muffler off. He never knew what hit him. Smokey Eunuch, NASCAR's best damn cheater, swapped SD parts into Chevelle's. When GM found out, they threatened to blacklist him. He laughed and said, tell him I'm farming. To save weight, Pontiac drilled holes in the Catalina's frame. Racers joked, you could light a cigarette through the floorboards. But GM's lawyers panicked. One crash and we're bankrupt. Was the SD the real first Hemi killer? Or did Chrysler's 426 save NASCAR, the discontinuation of the Super Duty? Despite its success, the Super Duty's reign was cut short. January 1963, GM's brass dropped the hammer. No more factory racing, no more Super Duty. But why? Officially, safety concerns. Unofficially, rumor says Chevy executives were jealous. Pontiac was stealing their glory and their profits. The memo warned that anyone caught violating the ban would be terminated. This decision was part of a broader corporate strategy to distance GM from the risks and liabilities associated with racing. GM didn't just ban racing, they sent goons. Factories were raided, blueprints burned. But Pontiac's engineers had a backup plan, a hidden warehouse with six SD engines, and a map to Daytona. GM says the Super Duty's gone, but what if it's not? The legacy of the Super Duty. Although the 421 was discontinued, its legacy lived on. The knowledge and technology gained from racing with the 421 were instrumental in the development of the Pontiac GTO, which debuted in 1964. Often referred to as the first true muscle car, the GTO was not simply a detuned version of the Super Duty, but rather a street-legal performance car that incorporated lessons learned from the 421's racing success. The GTO was an instant success, cementing Pontiac's reputation as a leader in the muscle car market. It featured a 389 cubic inch V8 and offered a combination of power, style, and affordability that appealed to a wide range of buyers. The GTO's success paved the way for other iconic muscle cars, including the Firebird and Trans Am, and solidified Pontiac's place in automotive history. The 421 Super Duty. Big block or not? One question that often arises when discussing the Super Duty is whether it qualifies as a big block engine. The answer is no, at least not in the traditional sense. Unlike engines like the Chevy 454 or Chrysler 440, which were designed from the ground up as large displacement power plants, the Super Duty was essentially a bored out version of the smaller 389. This made it a unique engine in terms of architecture and design. Pontiac itself did not classify its engines as big block or small block, further complicating the matter. However, what the 421 lacked in traditional big block credentials, it more than made up for in performance. With its forged internals, high compression ratio, and dual four-barrel carburetors, the 421 Super Duty was capable of producing impressive power and torque, making it a favorite among racers and enthusiasts. The Catalina and Ventura, unsung heroes, while the GTO, Firebird, and Trans Am often steal the spotlight in discussions of Pontiac's most powerful models, the Catalina and Ventura deserve recognition for their role in the Super Duty's story. These full-size cars, often overlooked in favor of their more glamorous counterparts, were the platforms that made the 421's dominance possible. In 1962, Pontiac built an estimated 179 Super Duty engines, with fewer than 200 total Super Duty cars, including both Catalinas and Grand Prix models, produced. 
The idea that exactly 421 Catalinas were built is likely a myth. These cars were lightweight, powerful, and purpose-built for racing, making them a formidable presence on the track. The Ventura, a more upscale version of the Catalina, also benefited from the 421's performance, further cementing Pontiac's reputation as a leader in high-performance vehicles. The Super Duty died, but its DNA didn't. Pontiac's engineers pulled a fast one. They slipped the 421's tech into a harmless streetcar, the GTO. Corporate never noticed, until it was too late. A legend that refused to die. The Pontiac Super Duty may have been discontinued in 1963, but its impact on the automotive world cannot be overstated. From its dominance on the drag strip and NASCAR circuit to its influence on the development of the GTO, the Super Duty was a true pioneer of the muscle car era. That tame 389 in the GTO? It had the Super Duty's cam profiles, ported heads, and a vendetta. What if GM hadn't banned racing? Could Pontiac have dethroned the Hemi? Would NASCAR still restrict aerodynamics? Comment below. The Super Duty didn't just make horsepower, it made history. And history has a way of repeating itself. Today, fewer than 179 Super Duty engines survive. In 2019, a barn in Ohio collapsed, revealing a 63 Catalina with a Super Duty VIN number. A 421 block stamped, Property of GM, Destroy. Was it a factory sleeper? Or a racer's relic? We're investigating, and GM won't return our calls. Is it real? Or just another myth? Tag someone who still has SD parts in their garage. GM's lawyers are watching. Until next time, this is Paul from Rare Car Stories. Catch you later.